first of all, let me just introduce, this is Rachel Dretzen. <laughs> We'd be surprised to know. Um, so, Rachel, let's just start with a really, really simple question, which is, why did you guys make this film? Um, two incidents, two experiences led me to make this film. The first was a conversation I had with uh, my sister-in-law about her son, uh, my nephew, who was, uh, at the time, I think about 12 or 13 years old. And this is a wonderful kid, I mean, a really mature, enlightened, sensitive kid. Um, and his mother, to her great horror, had gotten a phone call from a friend who said, have you seen, I'll call him Mark, have you seen Mark's blog recently? And she had no idea that he even kept a blog. He also had a very close relationship with his parents. And uh, she, um, she asked him, um, because evidently there had been a statement made on the blog that was extremely um, racist and hostile to a kid in his grade. Um, and he kind of crumpled when she confronted him about it. And he said, yes, I do have a blog. And yes, I did make this statement. And they spent a long time talking about it. What sort of came out of the conversation was that he, um, he was sort of trying something on. It was like the internet was a play space for him where he could kind of explore things that he would never have said in real life. Um, and, you know, he was, I don't think he had any sense of what he was doing. Um, even though, again, I have to emphasize just how unlike, unlikely a character uh, this kid was to have made these sorts of statements. And it, it really resonated for me because I was working on a project at the time um, on the mayor, about the mayor of Spokane, Washington, who was a Republican mayor who um, had... Uh, secretly been visiting gay.com and had, there had been a sting operation that the local newspaper had launched against him where they had hired a computer consultant to pose as a 17-year-old kid on gay.com and had seduced the mayor and then published everything and he was forced out of office. This is a very long-winded answer, but I no, no, no. wind it up. Um, what was interesting about that was that um, I don't think that the mayor... They never met, they never actually had sex, but the kinds of things that the mayor said online were the kinds of things I don't think he ever would have said in person. And I got very interested at that point in the way that the internet plays with one's identity. And I think as adults we all relate to this because there is something that happens when you go online and you're anonymous. Um, but I thought to explore that in adolescence when identity is so in flux and kids are really trying to figure out who they are, to explore the intersection of the internet with that would be fascinating. And that was sort of the, the first step on a very long journey, which we're still, we're still on. So, um, you know, that Sarah says, I, I am really who I am when I'm online. Autumn Eddowes becomes the real me. And so, so talk a little bit more about that. I mean, it, do kids, it, did you see a progression at all? I mean, you, obviously over time, Sarah, for instance, told her parents about what was going on. Did she still think that she was the real me online or did, did her sense of reality change through the process of this? I don't know the answer to that, um, but I would, definitely, uh, I would definitely raise the question about whether kids are the, the real me online or whether they're, they're a version of themselves online um, that's definitely at times different than the version of themselves that plays out in real life. But, um, I don't think it's quite as stark as um, the real me. It does allow all of us to say things that we would never say the same way. Um, I think it works that way with kids as well. But whether that's more honest or whether that's just something that's sort of released that allows them to be you know, less inhibited, crueler, uh, funnier, uh, try things on that, they would, that, that aren't them sometimes. Mm, mm. Um, I don't know. Okay, so um, let's... I have to ask you about Evan Skinner and Cam, all right? And I know that in some of the reactions on the website, uh, there were a lot of people rooting for the mom, and a lot of people were like, put her away, please. Um, and, and then, you know, of course, the, the teenagers were all for Cam. 
<laughs> well, just, you know, we're, we're on record here. This, uh, we're, this is all going to be uploaded onto YouTube, so, you know, be as frank as possible. Um, where, where, did, where did your production team, where did, where did the sympathies lie with those two? Or well, did, it, was it, did it vary? It did vary, and I will say also that I don't think we have ever had a character in a film that has gotten quite the reaction that Evan Skinner has. She just was like an atomic bomb. And I think it's because she did touch a nerve in all of us, even those of us who like to think we would never do what she did, relate to some of the things that that she talked about and I think for our production team it was similar um, you know Ara, Evan is a little bit of a caricature in certain ways but I think we all felt for her and I think we all understood as parents I'm a parent um, how, how frightened we can be for our kids how much we want to find a way to protect them how hard it is to turn away and not look at what they're doing on that screen um, so I think for several of the characters in this film, and I would say that the Ryan Halligan story is similar, um, they're exaggerated versions of, of real things that many of us, I think, feel um, mm. and understand. Um, so I like Evan. <laughs> you know, what can I say? She's a, she's a piece of work. Yeah. Um, just by the way, we're going to be going to questions. And if you have questions, just start making your way to the microphone here. Um, I also just want to acknowledge Ann Collier. Ann, do you want to wave? So there she is in the real flesh, and we'll hear from her. Feel free to jump up and uh, interrogate the producer. Um, talk about, um, I, I was particularly struck by Autumn Eddowes' father's reactions, mm -hmm. and him even coming towards the end of saying, I'm actually glad the internet is there. Did that surprise you? And what was the journey there with that family? Mm. I hope that 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 little scene at the end of the film sticks with people because it's so quick, but I think it's so important, um, the turnaround that her father did have, the growth that he experienced. Um, I mean, when we met that family, he was already at a place where he, you know, it had been some time since the, he had discovered Autumn's, Jessica's online life, um, and she had been expelled from school. And he really was already at a point, I think, where he recognized that his daughter had benefited probably more than she had been hurt from her online experiences. Um, but I think it's, it's extremely important to listen carefully to what he says. You know, his daughter was in a bad place and she was in a school where there were very few kids like her. Nobody really understood her. And she was able to find a sort of sense of self-esteem and a community online um, that she really wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. And, and in certain ways, I think it may have saved her from a far worse fate, actually. Um, and, uh, the one story I wish we had been able to tell in this film, but we didn't find a character, is, is you know, what it's like for a gay teenager who finds community online and who is able to kind of connect to other people and, and uh, navigate that very choppy period of adolescence when you're trying to sort of sort out who you are. Um, because I think that Autumn's story really speaks to that experience and to the experience of lots of kids who don't have community except online during that period of their lives. So, um, you know, I, I've heard, I don't, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I hear this is the second most downloaded documentary on Frontline, is that correct? I hear. I mean, I don't keep those, that, that, that data, but that's what, that's it what has I heard been this heavily morning, downloaded. And, and, uh, number, beaten by Bush's war, I understand. Well, and we're talking about just last season, because okay. there's a whole history of yeah. right. hundreds of documentaries. But yes, okay. for last season, I think it was. So there was, a, there was a lot of positive response to it, but there was negative too. So talk about the criticisms of your documentary. Well, let's see, where do I begin? Um, I think the, the principal criticism of the documentary um, is that it's fear-mongering, that it's, that it's too, it doesn't focus enough on the positive uh, things that the internet brings to teenagers. Um, and I think there's some truth in that. Um, you know, when you're making an hour-long, or should I say a 52-minute long documentary, it's very difficult to um, bring in everything you find when you're making it. Um, and so we did make decisions um, about excluding things all the way through. Um, and there are many, many things in the documentary that I think uh, could be expanded on. Um, and so for most of the criticism was, why didn't you talk about gaming? Or why didn't you talk about you know, gay kids? Or what, you know? And there I have to acknowledge that, yes, we, we couldn't. You know, we had 52 minutes. In terms of the, the sort of tone of the film, 
Um, we tried to walk the line um, very carefully. You know, when we started making the film, it was in an atmosphere of To Catch a Predator and a lot of hysteria about the internet. And we very much did not want to, to go down that road. We wanted to sort of bring some balance into the discussion. And at, at the same time, as a parent, I felt it was really important to speak to parents about where the real risks are online. Um, not to just sort of say, well, most kids don't get into trouble, so you don't have to worry about it, which is true, but to say, here are the kind of kids you do need to worry about. And so there is a sort of disproportionate amount of time in the documentary focused on those kids because I think that there really are alarm bells to be rung about vulnerable kids and how the internet can intersect with their risk factors. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, here's maybe a slightly related one. Um, so To Catch a Predator, you even reference it in your own documentary, and yet, um, you had real problems getting in touch with some of these kids. Isn't that right? Yes. Talk a little bit about that. It was so interesting. I mean, we, we, it was heartening and sort of shocking because we would try, we, we needed to talk to kids. Our decision from the very beginning of the process was we want to talk to kids first. We don't want to go to experts and find out what kids are thinking. We want to just meet kids and hear from them what they're doing online. And we started looking online for kids who kept MySpace pages or had YouTube videos that they would upload and trying to get in touch with them, you know, sending them an email saying, we're PBS filmmakers, here's our website, we've made many films, would you be willing to at least talk to us on the phone? Nobody. I mean, it was like, I'm sorry, but I don't know you, I don't know who you are, if you are who you say you are. Um, you know, I don't talk to people I meet online. And um, it happened enough times that we really began to think, okay, kids get it. And I think that's what we were trying to do here, is explain that while the risk of predation is real, there are incidents in which very bad things have happened to kids who have uh, been approached by strangers online. The vast majority of kids really have taken the message to heart that they are not to interact with strangers, give them out personal information, meet them if they're approached on the internet. Um, so that's a success story, mm. um, I think. And it's to the credit of people like you guys um, who have really worked at getting that message out, I think, that this is the case. Okay, okay. I want to talk about where you're going next with all this, but let's, let's have a break and, and get some questions in. So jump up, folks, don't feel shy. Let's go up to the, start a queue, start a line, go on. <laughs> Go ahead, and if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. Uh, I'm Shashi, I'm an employee here at Google. Hi. Uh, so thanks for the wonderful documentary from two perspectives, as a father and as an employee in Google, an internet company. So obviously, we are part of this whole ecosystem here. Uh, so I couldn't help but uh, uh, draw some similarities to the time I grew up, which was sort of very different from uh, the, the, the teenagers you showed here, right? 20 years back in India, uh, which already had uh, lesser modes to express oneself as United States 20 years ago, and no internet. So very different from this, right? And yet, uh, there were so many similarities. There were kids who would shut out their parents, kids who were insecure and have a different persona in school than at home, uh, just to become more popular, lie to become popular, uh, various things like that, right? Bullies, predators, all those things existed. It just seems like what all of Facebook or Google or whatever has done is made it easier for less talented kids in a sense, uh, talented in the sense of being able to fake all of these things, uh, to, to get involved in all of these behaviors. So what are your comments on that? I mean, do any of these traditional theories of adolescence and stuff still apply to this world, or is this, we just have to think about it new? No, I think it's a really important comment that you're making. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent as well, and I, I, of course, making this documentary was for me a sort of personal journey. Um, you know, in which I was exploring my own fears for my own kids. And it was very reassuring, actually, to see that adolescence really has not changed. I mean, kids worry about the same things they've always worried about. They, now they worry about them online as well as offline. But I don't think that the, the real sort of stark emotions of adolescence or the risks of adolescence have changed that much. It's just that I think for kids who, in, an, in, an, in a world 20 years ago, would have been at risk, kids who are, have eating disorders or who are depressed or uh, who are being bullied. The internet is a very powerful tool. And I think Anne at one point said this, um, you know, kids who get into trouble online get into even more trouble offline. It's not that the online world creates the problem. It can amplify the problem. It can uh, accelerate the problem. Um, 
it can be a bit of a rabbit hole for those kids. Okay. okay. I'm Peter Samuelson. I'm the uh, I'm here representing First Star, which is an advocacy organization for abused and neglected kids based in Washington. I, I'm I watched this amazing documentary partly uh, as First Star and partly because I'm the father of four kids, and the mind boggles uh, as a result of the documentary. The thought leaders in social networking right now. Um, are talking about where social networking goes, where it's cutting edges. Uh, and this, th some of the effects of internet too, and especially of the shift to mobile, are that the, th I'd be interested in what your thoughts are. Um, the film is rooted in internet one. It's the internet as it is right now. What, where a lot of social networking apparently, I'm told, is going, is onto mobile, which means it's no longer the child using it in the protected bedroom at home. It will tend to drive, because also of the GPS function, it's going to drive, apparently, social network members to meet, uh, because it'll be mobile. Uh, do you think that that's going to be a safer thing in the sense that if you bring it all back into reality, maybe behavior that's appropriate for reality will reign? Or is it actually more dangerous because now we'll have an additional layer of inappropriate people meeting inappropriately? Well, I would agree with your first point, which is that everything's moving to mobile now and therefore much less uh, sort of within the control of parents. Um, I'm not sure I agree with the notion that inappropriate people will meet as a result of social networking moving on to mobile, simply because I think the pr same principles apply. I do think kids get it, that it's dangerous to meet a stranger, um, somebody you don't have reasons to trust. It's okay to talk to them online to a point, but it's not okay to turn that into meetings. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily gonna change because they're able to access social networking sites uh, more portably raises questions for us as parents um, because the the whole computer in the living room thing becomes much less <laughs> successful if you've got your kid getting online on their phone the second they walk out the door. And I think it really, uh, what it all sort of adds up to is that they're going to go online. They're going to find ways to go online. And that's just a given. And trying to sort of restrict them, control them in terms of their access to the internet is futile. Uh, it's really about teaching them the principles of, of good behavior online, appropriate behavior online, civics online that we need to focus on. This is our reality for all of us, and kids are going to be accessing it at younger and younger ages. Hi. Uh, Jeffrey Barlow from the Berglund Center for Internet Studies at Pacific University. And I, I guess I want to ask a question that indicates a certain amount of disagreement here around the issue of has adolescence changed or not. And I too have been reading Palfrey and Gosser, the work that Frank used in introducing Stephen. I find it very powerful and I certainly recommend it uh, to everyone. The title is uh, Born Digital. I'm merely reviewing it. I have, I have no other interest uh, in the work. And they make the argument that the distinction between internet one and internet two is indeed a critical distinction. Their position is that, uh, and I, mean, I tend to agree that the film kind of bridges internet one and internet two. Their argument is that kids who are growing up within an interactive environment are much more open to revealing themselves. And although they understand in a theoretical way the dangers, in reality they so emphasize the question of interaction that they are a lot less cautious. In short, they're making the argument that this is an accelerating problem and that we as parents, uh, law enforcement, etc., are actually getting behind the curve on the development of this issue. Can either one of you comment on that? I'm sure that Stephen's uh, uh, knowledge is quite broad here as well. You know, um, I'm watching my own 12-year-old who just got her first uh, cell phone. Uh, it's a Samsung Glide, if you want to take notes on this. Um, I did all my backup research. I'm in the biz, you know. But it still shocked me and surprised me when she started filming me driving the car. Because I thought I'd, you know, I got the parental controls all worked out. Now, I knew she could take pictures, but I didn't realize she could take video. And um, so 
I, I, I think that, as we say, the internet amplifies, it, ex, it expands, it does things. I think it is changing the nature of simply being a kid. So, all right, another tiny little anecdote. I mean, on Sunday, I took her to Adams Morgan's uh, Street Festival. It's a big annual event in Washington. It's very funky, lots of music, lots of kind of things going on. And she brought a friend with her. Her friend doesn't have a cell phone, by the way, yet. She spent most of the time texting back to her friends somewhere else. And I said, put the thing away. Be here now. Dad, you know, I've just got a text message. I have to, do you see what I'm saying? So there's this kind of extension or expansion of beingness, uh, I can only put it that way, which I, I don't want to judge whether it's good or bad. It's just damn different from when I was a kid. Um, and actually, when I do, I go and talk to kids at schools and stuff. I, I, mean, I was talking to some seventh graders recently, and I said, guess how old I was when I first went and saw my first website? And they were like, mm, I don't know. I said, 39. <laughs> and they said, but how did you get in touch with your friends? And I said, well, we had bikes back in those days. You know, we, <laughs> but you know, what's odd is that kids don't go out. They don't bike around so much. We're so protective of their bodies, as it were, for being snatched on the streets. Um, and we, but, so, but we've created this, this slightly uh, odd situation where, in fact, they're in communication and can contact with far more people than they would be if they were just playing outside. Did you, do you want to respond to that? I just wanted to say that um, I think that you know, we're talking about a few different things here. Adolescence, the, the sort of things that kids really that matter to them, I don't think those things have changed. I think you're right, though, that the kind of state of being, the, the state of distraction and attention and focus and all of that, for all of us, is changing dramatically. For them, even more so. So yeah. we're not talking about predators here. But on, on the other fronts, I think there is obviously an increasing shift. Hi, I'm Natasha Jackson from the GSMA, which is the Global Trade Association for Mobile Operators. Natasha, just bring the microphone down. Sorry. Um, so I work for the GSMA, which is the Global Trade Association for Mobile Operators. And we've been looking at studies in different countries across the world about children's use of mobile phones. Um, and one study we supported in the UK brought up the relationship differences or gender differences between boys and girls in their relationships with mobile phones and in particularly what came out there was that the girls had a much stronger relationship and more often said they couldn't live without their mobile phone and I was just wondering from your um, work here whether you saw any gender differences. We definitely did. Um, I mean it, it's not that surprising. The boys did a lot more gaming which is a subject we, we didn't get into uh, but we will, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the girls, definitely, the social aspects of the internet were just more powerful for the girls, and it makes sense. Um, so they each had their passions when it came to their online activities, but they, were, they tended to be different ones. Rachel, uh, this is the third time that I've seen this show, and I just want to thank you. Every time I see it, I learn something new. So a, a job well done. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, and I'm Sorry, Deb, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Deborah Berlin with Consumer Policy Solutions. Uh, and I have a, a question, and I'm so glad that Ann Collier is here, because one of the things I wrote down is something she said, that discretion, discretion and privacy seem like a thing of the past. And I'm just wondering if you could talk for a moment about your observation in doing this about the change in perception of teens' privacy? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, there's no, there's obviously no doubt that it's very different now uh, than it was. Um, but I want to make a point that actually Dana Boyd made to us, which really stuck in my head, which is that it's not that they don't have a sense of privacy. They actually do have a sense of privacy. But it's a different definition of privacy for them. And what she, the way she described it was privacy is about control of your audience. They think they know who's watching them. When they put their pictures up on Facebook or on MySpace, mm -hmm. they assume it's peers. Nowadays, they know their peers because they, they can actually control who has access to their Facebook page. But even when they were putting their stuff up on MySpace or on YouTube, they made the usually accurate assumption that their parents and their parents' friends were not up at 4 o'clock in the morning to, you know, watching YouTube videos. So they do, they do care about who sees them. I think that they um, have a huge net now uh, that they cast in terms of sort of their public image. And um, certainly with, with, within their peer group, um, they seem to be comfortable 
exposing a lot of things that uh, we would just never have considered exposing when we were young. Okay, thanks. And did you want to respond to that at all at this point? Uh -huh. You're going to have to jump to the microphone. I'm sorry about this. Thanks, Tim. I'll defer. <laughs> sorry. No, go ahead. I, I have changed since we did that interview. That was two years ago yeah, so. or a year ago? No, it was over a year ago. It was well over yeah. a year ago. And um, I since have joined Twitter. <laughs> and <Me too. laughs> yeah. that has changed me a little bit. I also highly recommend... Clive Thompson's piece in the, in the New York Times Magazine Sunday because of the insights it provides on how village life is coming back. It's not that privacy has gone away, it's just that village life has reconfigured and it's coming back and we all kind of, the people we choose to share our lives with are just physically disparate. but there is that sort of um, village intimacy that um, seems to be a chosen thing. And there are risks involved, and everything that Dana said is true. But it's, it's not all bad. It's very interesting in a way. It keeps you honest. And um, that intimacy is very empowering in a lot of ways for kids. So it's just a fascinating kind of ongoing anthropology study that we can't possibly make any pronouncements about right now there, or, or find anything definitive to say because we're learning as we go and so are our kids. But it, I do think we're at a very transitional time and um, the, the dangers that we were talking about, and I'll speak to this later, two years ago are, are kind of gone or they're very different. And um, we don't have to worry as much as we did in the past, but I, I'm reaching the point of diminishing returns here. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to thank Anne because um, I can just say as a producer that it's very hard to find people who articulate ideas uh, that, that the way Anne does. And she made our job so much easier because there were so many times where we, we felt we were editing and we just said, no, somebody needs to say this, and there she was, and she always nailed it. So I really want to hand it to you. Thank you. Just a quick comment on that. That was a fantastic article. If you haven't seen it, go to the New York Times. And who's the, the, the writer? Clive Thompson. Clive Thompson. Yeah. So he. I follow him on Twitter. And you follow him on Twitter. Does right. he follow you? No. <laughs> so, so he makes the point. I mean, I, I started Twittering and I, or tweet, tweeting um, some time ago, and I gave up. I should probably go back and tweet again. But um, he makes the point that you know one individual tweet is pretty banal. But if you follow someone over weeks and months, it, it almost becomes a, a novel about this person's life. And, and it is quite extraordinary. Uh, that when I am following, there's a couple of people that I follow, and I, I feel a little nervous about following them all. Yeah. I'm like, do I really? I, you know, like I'm intruding, but then wait, wait a minute, he's just put that up, that he's on his way to the bathroom, you know, and he's coming back to make a cup of coffee. Do I really need to know this? You know, so there's a lot of existential issues there too. Right? Sorry, Tim. Steven, I think you're gonna have a lot more followers now. <laughs> tweet, uh, tweeting. Yes, you shouldn't have told me. Tweeting. Sorry. Um, Tim Jamal, I'm here representing WebWise Kids, national nonprofit organization involved in internet safety education. Great, great work, Rachel. A um, couple of uh, thoughts that came to me is that, one, you focused on adolescence, which I think is appropriate. Um, but as we know, and as a father of an eight-year-old, um, the uh, experience online is, is, is starting much earlier. Um, and so, uh, so a, a follow-up question, is there any interest in you know, producing a follow-up that really focuses on the younger generation, those at the elementary school level? And then second, you touched on, I think, an issue that a lot of us are grappling with is that the challenge of being safe and ethical online is involving the village. The, in New Jersey, the PTO, in California, the PTA, um, there's the teachers and the example of the, you know, the, the image of the dinosaur teacher who just right. can't deal with it. We all have that image and, uh, of, of, of uh, who was a good teacher but who's had trouble with dealing with reality today, which is technology and, and online experiences. So is there your sense of 
how do you see that playing out in terms of like curricula? Because we're, we're just really beginning that debate here in this country at the federal and the state level of, of the various entities, the teachers, the parents, the students. Um, so I'm glad you comment. mentioned that. Yeah. Um, so since I last uh, spoke at FOSI, uh, a lot has, has happened. Um, Frontline got such an overwhelming response to this documentary, and there seem, it seems to have really, you know, pushed a button for people. Um, there's, there's an enormous appetite to talk about this world we're in and how, it's, how dramatically it's changing. Um, and so we have decided to, to do a follow-up program, and we're going to be doing actually a much bigger follow-up program, um, which we're calling Digital Nation, which will look much more broadly. Um, it'll continue to look at the issues you know, we, we tracked in this film, but it'll also go, go way beyond that um, and look a lot at education, for example, um, and the sort of debates that are going on inside education about both the, the extraordinary possibilities that technology affords it and, and obviously the the worries we have about how exposure to technology is affecting our kids and, and their brains and the way they think and learn. Um, we're going to look a lot at, at younger children. Um, we're going to be looking a lot more broadly at gaming, uh, which I think is, is really a hole in this film, um, but it's a film in itself, um, and virtual worlds. And th that's obviously a, a very big piece of what's going to be happening in the next five or six years. Um, so we are, and, and one of the most exciting things that we're, we're planning to and hoping to do if all of the funding comes into place is not just make another documentary, but actually before the documentary airs, there will be a new website called Digital Nation. And on the website will be an enormous amount of content that one could never fit in a, in a 52 minute documentary. Um, lots of, of little small videos, but also lots of links and interviews and readings and forums and an interactive component and just hopefully a, a, a destination for a, a really uh, vital conversation about uh, digital media and how it's changing our world. Okay. So before we close, I just want to acknowledge a, a couple of other people here. So Chris Kelly from Facebook, there's Chris, and he moved from MySpace. Um, so you know we've been talking a lot about the social networking sites. You've seen them up here. That is also the focus of a task force that 49, not the 50, not Texas, who you did interview or was up there on the doc, on the screen, has is pressing the social networking sites to implement age verification, uh, identity authentication, and maybe even passing a law saying you have to be 16 to be on a social networking site. And yet, ironically, where the, um, where the sting operations occur on To Catch the Predator and various other types of places typically are chat sites, chat rooms. Right. So let's be controversial for a second, throw this question at you and just say, are the AGs barking up the wrong tree? Are, are, are they dealing with something which, or trying to deal with something that's already two years old? Well, look, I mean, the truth is, had they not been barking so loudly, perhaps kids wouldn't be so savvy. I mean, that's the first thing, is that, you know, there's a lot of the noise, I think, that was generated by this obviously overstimulated media attention to predators has uh, succeeded in the sense that I think, you know, kids and parents have got the message. On the other hand, um, Younger kids, you know, when you're talking about predation and social networking sites, it does seem that younger kids are not really, you're talking about kids under the age of 16, mm -hmm. are not really the place we need to be concerned. I think uh, there are other risks to social networking sites um, which, which younger kids are more vulnerable to, bullying being right. one of them. Um, of course, bullying can happen and often does happen on IM and on email and on all those sorts of things, but it happens on social networking sites. And so there are, I think, reasons for us to, to at least talk about when it is an appropriate age for a kid to be on a social networking site, how to teach them how to be on a social networking site, how to talk, how to act, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to, to predators, I think you're probably right that uh, okay. focus uh, has been a little bit off. I, I also want to acknowledge uh, Micah from YouTube and who has the, basically the global responsibility for what gets posted on YouTube. Good luck with that, Micah. <laughs> and uh, Ken from Second Life, um, talking about the virtual worlds. All of, everyone we here. We were there yesterday. Uh, right. And we were at your office So yesterday. we're all going to be uh, having lunch in a moment uh, in the back, and please stay and, and, and converse and, and so on. So uh, really, just to end by saying, um, you know, really, really excited about the next stage of the journey on this. 
Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who can help you uh, and help the team with uh, advice and suggestions and places to go. There will probably be no lack of oh, that. Please, this is the moment. We need everybody's so ideas and input. So get your business cards so out please. now, folks. And uh, please uh, mm -hmm. join me in thanking Rachel for coming out here today. Thank you.